um, this morning, uh, there have been some hard topics that have been preached on these pulpits. Last week was hard, suffering. And we'll continue on that same subject on persecution and suffering. And Eddie Mandoza did a great job on talking about our spouses, our lovely spouses. Sometimes they're annoying, sometimes they're loving. We just have to love them because I've been called to love. But the message this morning is going to be the one culture pushes back. And as we try to live this life that pleases God, it's going to be hard. This is a race. It's not like an, a sprint or 100 meter dash. This is going to be a marathon. It calls for endurance. It calls for a certain kind of lifestyle. By the way, this is a fight. And God is calling us to arm ourselves, to prepare ourselves as we pursue holiness. In the midst of this uh, persecution that our brothers and sisters were going through during the days of Peter, and as the Holy Spirit looked through the lens of history and began to address what's about to fall on the church, at that time, he calls them to do something that is very radical. Because the word of God is timeless, God never changes. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The principle on how to deal with pain, suffering, persecution, trials, temptations still remains the same. Now, the, pe the persecution that is happening during the pe people of Peter's times is not a political persecution. It's not a racial persecution. It's a persecution of their faith. These individuals and families dedicated themselves to serve God and not the king by worshiping idols or by worshiping the emperor. And so we need to really be equipped and understand that this is different. As we look around in the West, none of us today were scared of coming to church. It was our choice. Some of us was even debating, should I go to church? Or should I watch church on Zoom or WhatsApp, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram? in your jammies, sipping your cup of coffee, relaxing on your couch. Our brothers in the first century, it was a sacrifice to go to church. By the way, they never went to temples, they met in homes. And many died. Many were beaten. Many were tortured. And we come to America, 21st century America. This is, has been undermined. Christianity has been undermined. This is warfare. This is war, friends. And Peter has come to challenge us this morning on how to live, respond, prepare our lives for what is about to come. In some places, it has already started. Persecution is right here, knocking on our doorsteps. If you don't know it's started, breaking news, brace yourself for a wrong ride. It won't get better, it only get worse. But there is hope to that. When it gets worse, do you know what we should do? Look up. Behold, your departure draws near. I always joke about this when, was it two years ago, when they said, oh, there's a nuclear attack in Hawaii or some places, some other place in America. I was, yes, Jesus is about to come. Right? Because we have a promise. When those things happen, behold, your departure draws near. 
Stand with me, please, for the reading of God's word. First Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. First Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitudes. Because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans chose to do, living in bachelor, lusts, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless world living. They heap abuse on you, but they will have to give accounts to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they may be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but, alive, but live according to God in regard to the spirits. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind, that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gifts you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ to him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. So 1 Peter chapter 4 is now dealing with persecution, religious persecution. And so the question will be, and I've entitled my message this morning, a call to a holy living. How do we live this life of holiness? How should we respond? And as Peter has come to Peter, the Holy Spirit through Peter has come to help us, equip us, prepare our minds and our hearts, or now we should respond. So the first thing, or the first challenge is, Peter says, arm yourselves with the mind of Christ. Arm yourself with the mind of Christ. Now, when you are going through suffering or pain, common sense, you want to fight back. But Peter is saying, don't stack up on budgets. Don't stack up on any different weapon. Your weapon is the mind of Jesus Christ. That's the weapon you're going to fight or go through this persecution. Remember, this is not political persecution where you can go and protest. This is about you standing up for your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that you are not going to give in to the demands of the world. Friends, this is hard. This is hard. Because this is not popular. This, the world preaches different kind of message. Fight back. But the mind of Jesus Christ is the mind of surrender. The mind of Jesus Christ, or the art of Jesus Christ, is the attitude that is ready and willing to do God's will despite of the obstacles or the consequences that you are going to face. Why? Because Jesus is our great example. Jesus suffered unjustly. He died the death that you and I were supposed to die. He was mistreated. He was beaten. And he was killed. He was an innocent man. Never wronged a man. Never did anything evil. But he was mistreated. And so God has given us an example on how to respond to this kind of persecution. Jesus had all the rights and power to destroy Rome 
within a split second, but he chose to lay his rights and power down and to say, take me because of you and me. And so arming ourselves with the mind of Jesus Christ is that we have to be ready for what is coming. We have to be ready to obey the orders of heaven. We have to be ready to surrender ourselves to the will of God. Doing the will of God is not easy. I wish it was, but it's not. Doing the will of God sometimes may require you to lose your life. Like many other people in the Bible did. All the apostles lost their lives. They stood fame for what they believed. What do you believe? Arming ourselves the minds of Christ is dying to self. There are two things that take place when you come to know Jesus Christ. Number one, sin loses power over you through our union with Jesus Christ. The second thing is dying every day, crucifying the person you see in the mirror. The appetites, our desires, or the desires of the flesh. Every day, nailing them to the cross. That you are not going to displease God. I am going to live the life that pleases God. Pleasing God, living for God, it's not easy. It's not easy. And Galatians reminds us, Paul writes, I am crucified with Christ. It's not I who live, but Jesus lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You are a child of God. Sin has no hold of you. But it does not mean you are going to be sinless. Sin has no power over you, but the presence of sin is still around. This is why every day when we wake up, we begin our day in the presence of God, crucifying that flesh. You are not going to live. You are dead. Living for Jesus or having arming ourselves with this mind or mentality or attitude of Jesus Christ simply, simply means a complete abandonment from all former ways of life. No compromise with righteousness. You are a different person. Your goals, your values, your priorities, your destiny is different from the rest of the world. So therefore, I have to live in accordance with the word of God. And that is where the rubber meets the road. And this is so hard because culture will tell you something different. Friends, your real you is going to be seen or revealed during the time of immense pressure. When you go through some difficult times, the real you is going to be seen. Whom you trust who is your Lord and who is your Savior? Where your faith lies, where your priorities lies, where your goals lies will be revealed in time of immense pressure. Here's a second challenge. Don't waste your time living like the Gentiles. Simply means living like the unsaved. Why? Because you are a chosen generation. Why? Because you have been redeemed. Do you realize that you have been bought at a price? You are a blood-bought saint, filled with the Holy Spirit. And God is your Father. Your destiny is different. Our priorities should be different. We don't have time to waste living like the world. We need to live 
in accordance with the word of God. How are you living your life? Are you compromising? Is your, do you have one foot in the word and one foot in the world? It's about time we make that choice. These people of Peter's days, they used to go back, start remembering how they used to clap, how they used to patch, how they used to sing. He tells them, no, during times of persecution, it's time to hold on to what you have believed. Now, nowadays, most of us would say, we don't drink, we don't part, we don't do X, Y, Z. Well, let me make it simple for you. How many of us have a cell phone in here? And how many of us have Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and something, anything in between? How much time do we spend on those smaller devices? How much time do we spend scrolling on uh, who I liked your dog, who liked your flowers, who liked your new living room, who liked your spouses, uh, they have nice beards, who liked your X, Y, Z? And if they don't do anything, we get so mad. It ruins your day. And then you end up not even making a nice dinner because you're so upset. You make your family too fast over Facebook or Instagram. <laughs> Friends, I have made a promise to myself. I have told myself I'll never spend more than five minutes on Facebook. That is the promise I've made to myself. Why? I waste so much time. Waste so much time. There's no time to waste. People are dying. We are busy tweeting and retweeting. People are dying. So busy trying to fix things, look good in a while so we can take a good selfie. Waste of time. We all have 24 hours to use. And now you spend that 24 hours up to you and me. Time allows no overdraft or balances. If you don't use it in a way God designed you to use that in four hours, your loss is yours and mine. But remember, we are going to be held accountable. And so sometimes, uh, I know it's uh, spring. Everybody's so excited, especially the ladies, right? Make sure the flower bed looks so good. For the men, you spend countless hours Making sure that those vegetables look so great. And I'm not saying starve your families, not do gardening. Do gardening, but just know time management. Friend, this is so important. Because we are wasting time to things that does, adds no value to the kingdom. Do you know that in a couple of months or a few months, those flowers are going to die? You spend five hours on the flower beds. And then four is coming, and then they will die. And then you'll be disappointed. But lives are still broken. There's no time to waste. But living this life of godliness or holiness, it's going to cost you and I something. It will cost you your friends. It will cost you your family. It will co- might even cost you your job. It might cost you your business. Why? Because culture has a different way of defining who a Christian should be and should look like. So when you swim against the tides, people don't like it. You'll be called names. If you want to live for Jesus, be ready to be called names. You are going to be judged. You are going to be shamed. You are going to be disappointed. And they'll do all kinds of things just to draw you back into the the ways, into your former ways. Be ready, friends. So long the world is watching you, how you have changed, that you are living for Jesus Christ, you no longer participate in the activities or discussion or even the things that culture is pushing now, if you say anything different, 
you'll be labeled as a hater or as an enemy of society. Don't be discouraged because those people who are heaping abuse on you, who are talking evil about you, one day the God Almighty will hold them accountable. That is our encouragement. It's only for a while. And judgment soon will come. But I shouldn't pray for them to die in their sins. I should live out my Christianity publicly, privately, like the Bible calls me to do. Now, friends, don't give in to peer pressure. This is not about teenagers. Even peer pressure, sometimes adults go through that. There's pressure to change, to conform to the pattern of this world. Be prepared. Which one is worse? To be slandered by man, mocked by man, or to be judged by God? That should be, that should be a question we should all think about every single day. And as Peter continues, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15, he gives us these words. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. That's our response. Not to hate them. To respond with respect and gentleness. Here's the third challenge that Peter gives us. Live our lives or live your life in light of eternity. Why? Because the end of all things is near. Have you ever realized that today is a, is a day closer to your graveyard and to the second coming of Jesus Christ? This is not your home. We are just visitors. Don't go too comfortable. Don't go too comfortable. If you go to a good hotel where everything is made for you, the swimming pool, the hot tub, your kids will be swimming, you are relaxing, you enjoy the quiet time on the face of the planet, don't you forget that tomorrow you'll be going back home. Sometimes we do. This is not our home. We are just here for a short period of time. So how are we going to live this life in light of eternity? In anticipation for the second coming of Christ? In preparation for the persecution that is coming? I have three things to share with you. Number one, strive for personal holiness. Personal holiness. Peter tells us to be alert which simply means be spiritually aware of God's activities, of the opportunities that God is creating for you to be a light into the darkness. And then he says, not only should you be spiritually alert to, the active, to God's activities, but also to the schemes or attacks of the evil one. Guard your heart with the word of God. Fill your mind with the word of God. What are you feeding your mind when you wake up? What do you fill your mind with before you go to bed? Is it some good shows? Some good time old shows? Or a good time old time song? I just love that song. It's kind of, uh, it smooth as my soul. Men and women. Fill your, your mind with the very the word of God. Protect your hearts with the word of God. The only way we can pray effectively in these end times is when our mind is filled with the word of God, our heart is protected with the word of God, and we are spiritually aware to God's doing, or in other words, to walk in step with the Holy Spirit. To hear his voice to the opportunities and chances he's giving us to minister to the rest of the world. The second thing is strive to love one another and practice hospitality. 
Do you know what the, the, the fun thing is? Almost all the 10 uh, first uh, 100 best songs in the world, they talk about love. Love this, love that, love the cat, love the cat, love the dog, love the world. Name them. But, but, but how do we practice love as a child of God? This love is sacrificial love. And this love should be practiced in the body. In the body, there are going to be some differences. In the church, there are going to be people who are not going to get along. Because we live in this sinful, fallen world. In the body, we are going to fend one another. But how are we going to live in light of eternity? Should we just pass each other in Walmart? Don't say hi. Don't greet your friend because you are so mad about their dog. Some of the things we, uh, we, we, we fight over in the church, it doesn't make sense. Because the enemy doesn't like peace. If he can keep us divided, separated, he wins the day. But the Holy Spirit through Peter is calling us back to loving one another. Why? Because love covers a multitude of sins. Not one, not two, a multitude. The word multitude simply means multitudes of sins. You don't have to count, but to forgive and release those that have hurt you. Few years ago, I almost walked out of ministry. I was hurt so bad by the person I trusted. Stabbed me in the back and it was all, it was insane. And I went, I told some of the eldership, uh, my senior pastor said I have 20, 12 hours to decide if I'm going to continue doing this. And I went to pray and God told me, go back and continue what you are doing. Don't quit, don't give up, forgive. I have learned to forgive. Forgiveness is hard. Forgiveness is hard. I carry this burden for those days, weeks with me. And it was killing me. Until I went before God, I said, I'm ready to let this go. It wasn't easy. Today I meet this person. And the person never said sorry, by the way. And there are other people who never say sorry for what they have done to you. You just have to let them go and trust God for the healing process. I'm healed, delivered, set free. Today we'll meet and we'll talk as if nothing ever happens. But there's that tiny voice that comes and says, do you remember what this person did? I said, yes, I do. But I've been forgiven and I have to forgive. And the Bible says, no, don't you do love each other deeply, but practice hospitality. These people in those days, Peter's days, they opened their arms to strangers. They gave food. They came alongside who were hating and broken. Even the Roman soldiers that could not align their theology with them, agree with their theology. They fed them even before they killed them. One of those guys is by the name of Polycarp, a man I trust. I love to read his biography. He fed them, and then they killed him. But his testimony changed the Roman Empire. Friends, we can live that. And here is my favorite now. The Bible says, Peter tells us to strive to be obedient in using our spiritual gifts. So what is a spiritual gift? K. Arthur defined the spiritual gift as a God-given ability to serve God, another Christian in such a way that God is glorified and believers are edified. Now the moment you talk about spiritual gift, everybody thinks we're charismatic, right? Or Pentecost. No, we are not. It's in the Bible and we need to talk about them. There's a difference between a spiritual gift and a natural talent. Most of the people who play cricket, golf, and basketball, most of them, they are not saved. But they do a great job. 
A spiritual gift is received or given to us by the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. A natural talent or a talent is give, we, we get that, receive, or we inherit that gift at birth. So you are born with a talent. I know some of us don't have a talent, but that's okay. You have a spiritual gift. You have a spiritual gift. Every believer in here this morning, you have a spiritual gift. And God is going to hold you accountable if you don't use it. Because it's not yours, it's for to edify the body and to glorify God. Now, both the natural talents and the spiritual gifts, the source is God. One, the spiritual gift is for the church, to nourish the church, strengthen the church. A natural talent is to glorify God. Tim Tebow is one of them. He uses his talents to, as an avenue to minister to hundreds and thousands of people. So in the church, how should this look like? But there are certain things we need to clear. You don't choose your spiritual gifts. It's given to you by the Holy Spirit. So you cannot choose to be, I want to be a pastor, but I'm this. No spiritual gift is more important than any other gift, than the other gifts. We should not envy someone's gifts and we should not compete one another in the body. I know Matt Strait is a very good preacher. I don't have to compete with my brother. I know Matt Boyas is a very good leader. Look how many initiatives he has started. How many pastors has, uh, he has developed and is developing. And Eddie Mendoza is just phenomenal. Oh, now we do his administration. And if you talk of Dala, the brain, we call her, I call her the brain, She's, she does a very good job at administration. You give her something to do. As if she's in your brain, she'll do it exactly the way you are thinking. Why? That is the gift God has given her. And friends, we are all in here. Look around here. Every single one of you has a gift from God. You have a gift from God. No gift is greater, no gift is lesser. It's just a gift that God has given you and I to serve his people. So don't fall for the lies of the enemy or think that you don't have a gift or that your gift is not important. Spiritual gifts have been given to complete the church. The church is not complete without your spiritual gifts. Because if you are a window, if you are a door, if you are a, the carpet or chair, this room won't be called, it's not complete. It's incomplete. You cannot call a house without windows a complete home. You say, I love the house, but there's no windows. Therefore, I cannot live in that home. Friends, some of you are windows and doors. You know, I always give this example. How many of you said, thank God for a silverware? Thank God for a cooking stick. Because without a cooking stick or silverware, some of us are so demophobia, we are not going to eat food. I need, like, silverware. Right? How many of you said, thank God for a doorknob? Because I can open the door. And there are people who act like a doorknob in the church. And a lot of Peter groups these many hundreds of gifts into two groups. Serving gifts and speaking gifts. Serving gifts are like being a greeter. Administration. Being, uh, helping out people with all kinds of chores. Giving up your time to go and help somebody. That's a serving gift. Speaking gifts... If you teach first grade, if you teach fourth grade, that is speaking gifts. You start your material to be able and teach those kiddos. I cannot teach first grade. I don't have that patience. My patience is like this much. That's how far I can go. But some of you are so good with kids. Don't be afraid 
to step out and do what God has called you. And so, what well, is the purpose of the spiritual gifts then? Number one is to serve one another. Believers are called to serve one another, to meet each other's needs. Acts 13, verses 36 says these words. Now, when David has served God's, peop God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep, he was buried with his ancestors, and his body was decayed. What want to be said about you when you die? You're a good Christian. What want to be said about you when that time comes to go and meet your maker? Friends, look at the summary of David's life. He saved God's purpose in his own generation. The second thing, purpose about the spiritual gift is this, edification of the body of Christ. Your gift, that gift that you have, it's not yours. It's for the body. Equipping of the saints for the work of ministry so that God is glorified. And friends, you cannot do this by your own strength. You do this by the power of the Holy Spirit. God will give you the grace. He's going to empower you. Every single one of you is here this morning. If you are a child of God, you represent the grace of God. You have been given a spiritual gift. Here is my question for you. Do you know your spiritual gifts? If you do, are you using it? If not, what are you waiting for? And there are so, some avenues at the church where you can help, we can help you learn or develop, learn about your spiritual gifts. There's an open house. Stop by and see where you may be useful. And there's a way of life coming up next month. Go through that class and see where God has been is calling you to save. Friends, God has given us so much. The church is wealthy, not with money, but with gifts. If every single one of us this morning in here who step out and use our spiritual gifts, Think of what our Wasiana will look like. Think of how Northwest Ohio will look like. We have been blessed immensely. It's time to go out and use the gift God has given us. Let's all stand, please. As we come to the end of this service, maybe you have been Praying, and one of those people saying, you know what? I don't know what God has called me or is calling me to do. I don't know what my spiritual gift is. Or you just feel, I don't think my spiritual gift is greater, or you feel discouraged. You are very important, every single one of you. And I challenge you this morning. Use your spiritual gifts. God has given you so much. I've, been, I've said this to some people. Do you know one of the wealthiest places on the, on the earth? It's the graveyard. Because in the, at the graveyard, there are hundreds and thousands of dreams that, are not for, that people did not fulfill. Great gifts that were not used. All buried with those people. I challenge you this morning. Step out of your comfort zone. And let you be used by God according to the way he has called you to be used. God bless you.